you know, go down the, I got some stats here real quick and we'll just jump right into it. And you pop in when you want to pop in and correct me, tell me where I'm wrong. If there is such a thing. I'm sure you're not. I'm sure <laughs> you're spot on. <laughs> All right. Let's get this thing started. Uh, one, I'll give it a three and we'll jump. Just awesome. Hit my arm. Three. All right. You ready to there? Hey, welcome back to Bonding with Mark and Andy. I, of course, am Andy. That there is Mark. It uh, it's uh, still morning where I'm at, but afternoon where Mark is at. So um, it's tea time. It's we're, six we're, o'clock. Yeah. We're midday. It's midday for me. But anyway, we're here discussing the uh, the next movie in the in the line, Thunderball. Look up, look down, look out. It's Bond. It's yeah, better. It's better. Yeah, the biggest bond of all. So this was so we're going up um, in numbers here real quick. I'll jump in. Uh, this one sits currently at Rotten Tomatoes. It's at eighty five with the critics, seventy three with the audience. So it's it's uh, it's up there. Not as high as Goldfinger and From Rush with Love and all that, but it's still up there. The budget jumped quite a bit for this one. This went up to nine million dollars. So and it shows. There's a lot you can see the money on the screen in Thunderbolt. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on. Uh, the box office numbers that I could find currently, it was uh, it had made 141 million dollars. Um, that's a lot of money. I th I think I could be wrong, but I think Thunderball made as much as the previous, the first four Bond films, and it also made as much as the next five Bond films to come. It was hugely successful, Thunderball. Yeah, that's crazy. I have yeah. to look that up to verify that those numbers. That's crazy. Um. So this was written by – so we'll, we'll talk about the writing here for a minute. The so writing this, thing, if you're going to go there, yeah, it's an infamously long story about Thunderball and what happened. Right. Yeah. S tell what you know. I, well, I'll, I'll name the writers that are credited, and then I know there's a story behind it. And of course, our director, Terrence Young, comes back. There's a slight story about that. They wanted uh, uh, Guy Hamilton. He needed some rest. They couldn't wait. Went back to Terrence Young. But writer-wise, this thing is credited to Jack Whittingham, who wrote the original screenplay. That's right. And I think that's where the story comes in. And then it's also cred credited to Richard uh, Maybaum and John Hopkins and, of course, Ian Fleming, who wrote the original story. But, but don't forget he, Kevin McClory. And Kevin McClory, right. I, I didn't have his real name, and I'm just drawing a blank there for who it was. Now, from my understanding, Mark, and you, you correct or jump in, is – this started out as this was supposed to be the first movie or no. Uh, yeah. Something like that. But Dr. No, because of the chief of budget it was all set in Jamaica. So they did it. They did it all in Jamaica. So that's why Dr. No came first. And but this started as a screenplay, correct? And then Thunderbolt started out, out. started out as, as a short story written by Fleming in combination with this guy, Kevin McClory and other people. They ditched. They were. I think they were. Gonna, they were trying to turn it into a, into a movie before Broccoli and Saltzman came along. So it was this, this this unused sort of script that Fleming had come up with with other people. But then, after it was abandoned for its original purpose, Fleming decided to turn it into a book anyway. So he turned the screenplay that he wrote with Kevin McClory into a book called Thunderball, and then published it. But then was slapped with a lawsuit saying, I came up with half of this story. You can't turn it into a <laughs> book. And the, the the ensuing legal dispute on, went on for years and years and years. And they only finally resolved it in 2006 when Daniel Craig was casting Casino Royale around about that time because there was all sorts of, you know, they, they weren't allowed to use the word spectre. There were certain things that Kevin McClory said he came up with concerning spectre. Yeah, it went on and on and on. Really? Yeah, it went on for a long time. So, and for the in 1983, when Sean Connery made his big return as James Bond, he was in a movie called Never Say Never Again, which is a basically a remake of Thunderball, and they were able to do it because Kevin McClory got the rights back or something. It's a very long legal story, but the return of Connery is a remake of of Thunderball. Really? Oh, I look forward to seeing that. No, it's not a great film. <laughs> Well, I look forward to the comparisons. Um, wow. Okay, so that's that opening. So let's jump into the um, the film. The opening, the opening scene is interesting because it opens with a, a funeral, 
and you see JB on the casket, which immediately my first I was like, oh my god, James Bond starts out dead. Exactly. Of course, cut to he's up in the balcony, um, and then the, the the movie moves along and it goes to uh, well, he's gone to the funeral of an of a Spectre assassin called Jack Bouvier. I think yeah, Jack, yeah, and um. He's killed several of James Bond's colleagues, so Bond is there to make sure that the guy is actually dead. But he's faked his own death. He's not really in the coffin. He's dressed up as the widow. And Bond notices this because he's got a slightly manly walk or something when he gets into the car. And I so think he, he opens his own door. Yeah, that's it. Something and like that. And that's what threw Bond the hint. Yeah. He's like, you should, <laughs> so a, he says a line, you should have opened your own door. The guy that's supposed to be dead is dressed up as the widow. And off she goes in her limo back to her chateau because chateau, they're in France somewhere. And Bond follows follows him out in there, and goes to the chateau and confronts the man. <clears throat> and basically, they have a they have quite a quite a big fight, pulling carpets off walls and <laughs> beating yeah. each other with pokers and things like that. But Bond eventually gets the better of him, chokes him to death with a poster, <laughs> uh, a poker, <laughs> and then leaves as the henchmen come in with their machine guns and everything st start firing. Manages to get to the roof. Yes. How's he going to get down? How's he going to get away? And oh. He's tucked away a handy Bell jetpack. Yes. With, with helmet. And the question I have is whenever I watch it, I mean, it's a great, it's, it's Bond, it's gadgets. The guy's got a jetpack and he uses his jetpack to fly off the top of the castle and land right behind his Aston Martin DB5. But how did he get the jetpack up there in the first place without being spotted? That's what I want to know. Yeah. These are little things when you're watching, you're like, and good. then when he lands, because those jetpacks, I, I looked it up. Those jetpacks could only go for about 30 seconds. They're literally just a quick short. Yes. But they've got proper jetpack engines on the back. Yes. And it lands behind the Aston Martin, and the woman that he was with um, opens up the boot for him. And he picks it up, takes takes the straps off, picks it up, puts it in the boot of the Aston Martin to, to make his getaway. How on earth did he do that? That thing would be glowing red hot. How did he what? manage to put it straight in the boot? I didn't even think about that, but yeah, it had to be hot, right? Because it's of course jet it's a jet, it's a jet pack. Those nozzles where the jets come out, they've got to be searingly hot, and yet he just throws it in the boot. Well, he's like James Bond. Hmm? You know, he he's James Bond. He walks in the room, it gets ten degrees cooler. Well, <laughs> even so, I thought it was a, I thought it was quite impressive. Yeah. So the fascinating. So let's, let's let's back up a minute. The opening scene. Now, I knew nothing about this movie. Did not read this book, and I see him throw a punch at a woman. And I was like, wait a minute. That is a heck of a way to start a movie, James. But, of course, it leads to the un unmasking of, of uh, the Spectre Assassin, the Spectre Jack Assassin Jack which was fascinating. And then, again, the jetpack was awesome. I'm watching this. And I, I did a little research on the they, – they, they didn't want Connery to wear a helmet. But the, the stuntman who had to do the flight, there's only two people in the world at the time who could fly that. And he, both of them said, we're not doing that without a helmet on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they made Bond put the helmet on for the for the thing. And you're right. It has about a 20 to 30 second uh, That's right. window. Uh, it's a great it's a great moment. I mean, it's a fabulous well, it's, Bond yeah. moment. But my question always is, how did he get that damn thing up there? Yeah, and, and it's 1965. It like, I didn't know that technology was around then. It was the very first one. But that was the only I think, that, like you said, there's only two in existence or something. There, well, there were only two people who knew how to fly the thing. Yeah. Or that they trusted to fly the thing. So it was a cutting edge at the time. And then I remember you messaged me. I hadn't got this far in the film yet about the uh, water cannons in the oh. back of the DB. Well, so he lands behind the Aston Martin, <laughs> throws the jet back in, in, in the boot like a set of golf clubs, gets in the car with this woman to, to drive away. And these henchmen come out firing guns at him. So he uses the Aston's <coughs> gadget e equipment. And the water, it, there's a water uh, cannon coming out of the exhaust. How on earth did that sports car carry that amount of volume of water to be an effective <laughs> water cannon? It just, it just doesn't make sense. Where well, is all that water stored? And the other thing that I didn't get, and, and again, it, it wouldn't make sense in, if the movie worked this way, but why didn't they just step out of the way of the cannon? Exactly. It seems like they were just shooting straight. So it's straight like, at it, yeah. If, it they made just, no, if you went it to made the no left, sense at all. you could keep shooting at Bond. Yeah. But it I mean, made, it wouldn't. It wouldn't make sense. So it was I a don't. nice link into the credits because Thunderball is very much a, a water-based sort of movie. So the credit starts yes. and it's all water. That's a, that's probably one of the reasons they did it. But it makes no sense at all. Yeah, and, <laughs> and then the, we have the uh, another another great. I, I liked the theme song to this. I don't know where you rank it. 
Yeah, it's uh, a cl- and again another classic. The Tom to- Tom and Jones. Uh, there's there's that old story that t- Tom jo- Tom Jones like Shirley Bassey tried to h- hit that high note at the very end and he passed yeah. out while he was doing it. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah, qu- that's qu- insane. Qu- quite a good yeah. story. Well, it's funny because we were watching it. I was watching the beginning with Teresa and and I looked at her and said. That sounds like Tom Jones, doesn't it? And she's like, I think that is Tom Jones. And yeah, it is. Yeah, it's Tom. Yeah. Teresa's mom was here, and she's like, hey, I think that's Tom Jones. She's in the other room. <laughs> so of course the credits roll, and you see it's Tom Jones. And he wasn't the original. They wanted. Um, so what I'd read is, uh, well, the, there was the song "Kiss Kiss Bang Bang." That's right. Yeah. Uh, they wanted um, Shirley Bassey, and then they. They went to, I think it was Dion Warwick at one point in time. And then they didn't, I think there was an issue with the song. They didn't want the song to be the opening song because they didn't, it didn't have the title. title. So they, uh, the Barry, the composer of the, of the music, he went and had a song written called Thunderball. And of course, which, uh, at one point in time, I read that, um, Tom Jones asked, what is a Thunderball? And the guy's like, I have no idea. (laughs) A Just thunderball to... apparently is what they call when you set off a nuclear device. That big sort of the the big oh, okay. cloud erupts as it goes up into the mushroom crowd. That's a thunderball. Oh, that's great! It mm. makes sense too. Mm. When the when all the smoke goes up and it has that big sort of ball in it and goes up becomes a mushroom. That's yeah, that's a thunderball. Oh, that's great! Look at me learning something. Uh, so then we help. we cut to uh, again. We've talked about this in the last episode. The uh, we see a uh, Ford Thunderbird coming down the uh, road. That's right. Again, the, the car placement. And uh, this gentleman jumps out of the car after y- being yelled at that he can't park there. Of course, then he stares at him with his one eye. It gives him a great look. You don't mess around with um, Emilio Lago. No. I know. And the I look like... he gives the guy. Monsieur, monsieur, you can't park there. The look, he, the look of sheer contempt he gives him is great. Yeah, the guy was, I mean, said nothing else. But then the part that I found interesting is that he actually steps right into traffic without any regard for the car coming at him. Because hmm. he just doesn't. His swagger was like, you, you're not, you're not going to hit me. Yeah. I'm parking my car where I want to park my car. Yeah. I've got this jacket over my shoulders because I can. I don't have to put my arms in the sleeves. Straight across. No, he's a great villain. <laughs> Walks in. So he goes in and he gets into the room. And uh, of course, they, they do a close up on the gadget that opens the door because I think oh, they. they a little cigarette case, isn't it? Opens it yeah, up. they like to show all the stuff and it's pretty neat. <clears throat> and then we get this whole, uh, this, this great long shot of, and I guess these are all Spectre. Uh, uh, I had an issue with the volume on my TV at the time, so I had a real issue understanding what was going on here. But this was all the Spectre uh, assassins. It's, 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 it's the front, the front, the front door that he goes into when he walks across the room. It says it's a charity. I think it's Medicine Sans Frontier or some yeah. Frontier, something like that. But when he goes in <clears throat> and goes out the back and uses his his gadget, the, the secret door comes back, and it's actually a, a Spectre headquarters in Paris. So they're posing. That's how awful Spectre are. They're posing behind the character. <laughs> and he's number two. In the, he's they, number they use two, these yeah. numbers. Number one is the is the guy who just broke in the cat. Yeah, he's uh, number two. Largo is is, is yeah the, the the second in command. Yeah, uh, I I like the. Um, so he's going down the line, and I'm I don't get what the again you can film me because I didn't quite get what the meeting was about. It was about the the prophets. Yeah, just like a spectre meeting discussing the nefarious crimes and because they, that they're getting up to. They get to a point where he's asking number 10. They're going through all their different crimes and what they've achieved and how much money they've made. And he, and there's an accounting error, apparently, from the United States. That's right. Um, and number nine uh, disappears through the floor. <laughs> it's right. just gone. He's clearly pilfering money, and they've caught him out, and he's electrocuted in his, in his chair where he sits like that. And, and he's gone, which is there's also no there's a scene that is one of the Austin Power movies that I see where they got that from yeah. now, which was funny with Will Ferrell. Uh, so that was that was enjoyable to see this guy just disappear to the floor. And th- the callousness of uh, uh, everyone around him, like they watch this guy get electrocuted well, Lago, and Lago die. Just looks, looks at the smoking corpse and then just goes back to his papers. He's not yeah. interested at all. Moving on. And then right down the agenda. <laughs> so uh, very impressive. So then we uh, they cut to the health clinic where um, uh, Bond is at, but uh, the the um, the pilot, Shrubland, 
yeah, the, he's getting the plastic surgery and all that. Well, Largo's come up with a plan to make a huge amount of money by holding NATO to ransom by stealing two nuclear bombs. And he's come up with a plan to replace the pilot of one of these Vulcan bombers, bombers that's got the nuclear bomb on it by substituting a, a, a one of his specter men that's had plastic surgery to look like him. Yes. The guy with plastic surgery is recovering at Shrublands, it's this health farm, which coincidentally is where Bond has been sent to recover from all his, you know, from the broken and ribs he got in the yeah, uh... his broken ribs and his his, uh, his his drink problem. So he's he turns up at Shrublands expecting a quiet couple of weeks resting and relaxing, but no, he walks straight into a spectre plan. Absolutely, and uh, as his Bond is sitting there uh, being looked at by one of the nurses, he notices the tattoo. The specter, right. the specter tries tattoo. to cover it up. Yeah, it's a specter tattoo, I think, isn't it? Something? Yeah. So he notices that, and of course, Bond being Bond, he's uh, there's a nurse who's trying to to take care of him, and of course, he forces himself upon her as oh. as Bond would do. Yeah. Again, we are in this awkward stage of like, I ah, probably shouldn't be doing that. Nurse Patricia Fearing, her, her name is, I think. Yes. And the actress was called Molly <laughs> Peters, and I do believe she appeared in Playboy at one point. Oh, did she? I believe so. Yeah. I'd but say again, I'd, I'd looked that it's up. Another and... example of some of the classic Connery '60s movies not aging particularly well because he does sort of get her in that sauna and push her up against the wall, and it's like mm. she yeah. basically gives in because he's Bond, but it, it's a bit near the right. I mean, she doesn't fight hard, but yeah. she, I think it's maybe maybe it's because she's on duty and this is inappropriate because I'm I'm in my I'm exactly working. yeah she's John, working. James please. Working. So I like when she puts him on the automatic traction machine. And he's he's stretched out, and then it makes a very sexual motion, stretching his spine because <laughs> he's got lesions or something. Yeah, well, his rib cage is all battered That's because it. he got he uh, took a couple of blows with the uh, poker uh, fighting there at the chateau, as they say. That's right. Uh, but I like that. And then we get to the bomber plane. Uh, I'm moving as, as I go. Uh, I mean, there's the whole scene where the uh, the pilot, the one who's had the plastic surgery, he goes to get his directions and he demands more money. He's the, the pay, the pay was a hundred thousand. He said, no, I want two fifty. And the guy, it's funny. The guy behind him was going to shoot him and kill him for that. And I'm like, well, you know, you're not going to kill him because you need this guy to fly the plane. So, I, I mean, I like the effort, I like the thought. And then the girl of course says, no problem. We'll take care of it. Knowing full well, he's not going to make it. Uh, they get to the bomber plane, and he's got this little tube cylinder that's going to have uh, gas in of some sort. It's going to knock everybody out on the plane as he's flying it over the the Caribbean there. And I just note that I, I luckily there was a port for him to plug that sinister that's uh, right, canister yeah, that's into. Handy. I don't know that why the plane would have that there, but luckily for him, it was there. He just popped it in, and next thing you know, gas is enveloped the. Uh, the cockpit and the plane has now been taken over by uh, the evil pilot. This is his name, Francois, are... Francois, Francois Duval. That's his name. Yes. And uh, the, they're heading towards the Caribbean to meet up with uh, Largo because this is where they're going to store the the uh, the nuclear. They get, they get two of them, right? The two, there are two nuclear, nuclear bombs. bombs on board this RAF. Avro Vulcan, and he flies it to is it, yeah the Bahamas. And he's, Nassau, he's the Bahamas, and Nassau, I, the Bahamas. He's going to gently crash it into the water. They're going to take the bombs off the Vulcan. And yeah, I mean, how amazing is it? I I love the fact that he they put a runway in the water, like they mm -hmm. lit it up so the guy could see. And uh, he he puts it down, and then the plane just sinks to the bottom. So all model work, and I mean they didn't obviously crash a real. Aria Falcon, but apparently, when they finished filming, because it was a full scale, I, I think, or not far off, off full scale model of that plane, because the Vulcan V wing bomber is quite an impressive, impressive aircraft. Yeah. Apparently, they blew it up so that the, the, the model so it couldn't be used for anybody else's filming and left it in the water. And it's now a reef, it's turned into quite a successful. Oh, really? Yeah, apparently. Oh, that is that's fascinating. Well, I like that. Uh, so let's see. So let's let's wrap this episode up with that because I want to pick up on our next uh, the next episode. We're going to talk about the massive MI6 uh, conference room 
Oh, uh, with all the agents from all around the world. Another another massive set that I want to uh, just Ken Adams was fantastic with designing this thing. So uh, let's go ahead and just call this one. Uh, we'll wrap this one up. We'll pick it up on the next one. Okay. See you at the See next one there.